you are welcome to this evening's talk titled Made in Ghana, the contribution of Eastern European architects to nation building to be delivered by our guest speaker, Professor Lucas Tadek. Dr. Stanek, you are welcome Thank to you. the GIA. Ladies and gentlemen, this evening I have the pleasure of introducing to you Dr. Stanek, a professor of history from the Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning, Michigan, and one of architectural history's top academics, an award-winning author, and a well-sought-after conference speaker across the world. He graduated in architecture and philosophy after studies in Krakow, Weimar, Münster, and Zurich, and he received his doctorate at the Delft University of Technology in 2008. Dr. Stanek taught at the Swiss Federal University of Technology in Zurich, Harvard University GSD, and the University of Manchester before taking up his appointment at the Taubman College. Dr. Stanek's broad research is on the mobilities of architecture and urbanism from European socialist countries to Africa, Asia, and the Middle East during the Cold War, and its impact on current processes of urbanization in the global south. Hailing from Poland himself, he was pleasantly surprised during his research to hear intriguing stories from retired Eastern European architects on their stay in Ghana during the 60s. Since then, Ghana has absorbed his focus. For his work on the history of Ghana's modern architecture, he has been rewarded with a number of prestigious awards. His paper, Architects from Socialist Countries in Ghana, 1957 to 1967, Modern Architecture and Mondialism in 2016, won the Founders Award by the Society of Architectural Historians. That led him to write his book, Architecture in Global Socialism, Eastern Europe, West Africa, and the Middle East in the Cold War, which won the 2020 Royal Institute of British Architects Presidential Award for History and Theory Research. We have a copy of that book here. This book, yet again, won the 2022 first book prize for the International Planning History Society. A whole chapter of its pages is dedicated to Ghana, Ghana's history of modern architecture. This lecture was organized by the Ghana Institute of Architects and the Center of Architecture and Art Heritage Africa, an organization with a mission to restore urban memories and revive public interest in architecture, past and present. Dr. Stanek, we are honored to have you speak to us. Our attention is all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Kodra, for this introduction. And uh, I'm very honored to speak here at the Ghana Institute of Architects, which is an organization I have been studying as, as a historian. And thanks a lot for being uh, here and online. I'm going to speak today about this book, which, which Kodra just mentioned, Architecture in Global Socialism, Eastern Europe, West Africa, and the Middle East in the Cold War. The book um, was published by Princeton University Press in 2020. And if there is there's one word to summarize that book, uh, that word would be collaboration. Uh, the book shows how, during the Cold War, architects, planners, and construction companies from socialist Eastern Europe collaborated with their counterparts from the newly independent countries in West Africa and the Middle East. The book shows how this collaboration shaped five cities. And among these cities is the topic of this lecture tonight, which is uh, Accra. Other cities included Lagos in Nigeria, Baghdad in Iraq, Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates, and Kuwait City. 
And so the book shows how the urbanization was shaped by the collaboration between local actors and those from socialist Europe. Now, this is a book in architectural history, so um, visual materials are crucial sources. And uh, they include diagrams and drawings and photographs and so on. And so I would like to start with um, sort of showing you this book very quickly so that you get a sense of what kind of material you can find in it. So um, this is an introduction which uh, broadly introduces that uh, topic of architectural mobility with some examples which are not discussing in the, in the following chapters, such as here, for example, Algeria or, or um, Zambia. And this is the first chapter focused on Ghana with uh, these buildings that all of you uh, recognize. Uh, and that includes this very important ensemble, which, which is the protagonist of the first chapter and also the protagonist of uh, this talk today, which is the International Trade Fair in Accra. Uh, this is the following chapter, which uh, focuses on Nigeria and discusses uh, Hungarian urban design projects, here Romanian projects for Lagos, but also a number of projects that were developed uh, by Nigerian and Yugoslav collaborators. This is the chapter on Baghdad with this major document, which is the master plan of Baghdad developed by a Polish-Iraqi team and prepared by a range of these, these um, uh, studies. But uh, I also talk about things like these, uh, military infrastructure from East Germany or type projects uh, uh, from Romania. And this is the final chapter which focuses, or starts at least, with this major building in Abu Dhabi, which is a town and planning uh, department, which was a Bulgarian project that was execu executed by a range of actors from the UAE and from other places. But the chapter also discusses a number of private offices in Kuwait and, the, and Abu Dhabi, which hired Eastern European architects. So uh, as you see from this overview, um, Eastern Europeans were part of a broader mobility of architecture after World War II. And architectural historians have discussed uh, the various networks that uh, contributed to these mobilities. These networks included late colonial and post-colonial uh, frameworks from Western Europe, technical assistance by the United States, uh, international organizations such as the United Nations and networks of economic globalization. And so my book complements and builds upon that uh, previous scholarship by focusing on networks from socialist countries, a topic until recently almost completely absent from the historiography of architecture. And uh, that, ans that absence in itself is an interesting thing to think about. Uh, clearly, I would, I would say that one, one reason for this absence is, uh, is the difficulty in the access to sources. And so one of the contributions of this book is, is to bring to the fore, uh, until now, unknown materials from public and private archives from Eastern Europe, from West Africa, including Ghana. But I believe that... Uh, there is another reason for this absence, and uh, that is capitalist triumphalism, that after the end of the Cold War uh, equated architecture's globalization with westernization or Americanization, and then retroactively projected this narrative on the history of architecture after World War II. By contrast, this book points at the heterogeneity and multiplicity of networks which contributed to architecture becoming worldwide. And that included uh, heterogeneity and multiplicity of the socialist networks themselves. I'm thinking here, for instance, about the bifurcations of socialist networks in the wake of the split between the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia in the late 1940s, but also the bifurcation of socialist networks in the wake of the split between the Soviet Union and People's Republic of China in the course of the 1960s. And furthermore, in difference to most histories of modern architecture, my book does not study modern architecture as diffused from 
uh, Western Europe or, or from Europe indeed, uh, or North, Afri North America, but rather with the already focused mention of, uh, of, of uh, collaboration, this book argues that modern architecture was co-produced by architects, planners, and construction companies from socialist countries and from the newly independent countries. And I think that a crucial place to talk about these processes was Ghana during the first decade of the country's independence between 1957 and 1966. A good starting point for introducing architecture in Ghana at that period is the International Trade Fair in Accra. This photograph shows uh, the International Trade Fair after its opening. Uh, the fair was initiated by President Kwame Nkrumah, but it was opened in February 1967, so uh, already after the coup, which toppled Nkrumah the year before. Today, as you would know, uh, there is not so much left of the trade fair. Uh, so let me give you a brief tour down memory lane, and uh, I will talk about these, this, this round pavilion uh, over there in the right uh, corner, and then I will talk about the pavilion in front of it, and then moving to the left, I will show a few images of these uh, pavilions uh, which were planned as temporary. On the, on the left, I'm showing uh, images from the 1960s, and on the right, I'm showing images uh, of photographs that, that I took 10 years ago. So this is the entrance pavilion, or the pavilion for the African states, and here you see the uh, interior uh, of, this, of this building. Uh, next to it was the so-called Pavilion A, or the Made in Ghana Pavilion, and with this fabulous roof to which I'm going to come back. Uh, the, then there were further pavilions which were designed as temporary, but they had a fairly long life, and uh, then others uh, which were built for Ghanaian state firms, including the cocoa industry pavilions, uh, which you can see here. The fair was designed and constructed between 1962 and 1967 by the State Office Ghana National Construction Corporation, or GNCC. The GNCC was responsible for design, construction, and maintenance of government buildings and infrastructure in Ghana, and so it played a crucial role in uh, the programs of economic and social modernization under uh, President Krumah. The head architect of the GNCC was the Ghanaian architect Victor Adegbite. Adegbite graduated uh, from the architectural program at Howard University, the prominent black college in Washington, D.C., in, in, in the United States. He graduated in 1954, and then he received a scholarship to, uh, from the United Nations to study uh, for one year at the Inter-American Housing Center in Bogota, in Colombia. Adegbite returned to Ghana in 1956, and then he assumed a position of chief architect in two key institutions in this country. First, uh, as, as chief, architect, chief architect of the Ghana Housing Corporation, which was in charge of the, of the country's housing program, and then, since 1962, at the GNCC. The design architects of the trade fair were two architects from socialist Poland, Jacek Hirosz and Stanisław Wymaszewski. And on the left, you can see them at the trade fair in 1960. And on the right, you see Mr. Hirosz during my interview with him in Warsaw in 2020. At the GNCC, Hirosz and Wymaszewski worked together with a small but a growing number of Ghanaian architects and a larger team of foreign professionals, among the many from socialist countries. And these uh, collaborations reflected the exchanges of Nkrumah's government with socialist countries. The coup uh, interrupted some of these exchanges, but not all of them. And that was testified by the presence of Hungary, German Democratic Republic, so East Germany, Czechoslovakia, and Poland on the trade fair grounds. The Soviet Union and People's Republic of China, two major allies of Nkrumah, were also included into the 
original plan, but they were removed from the fur after the coup. Rather, uh, the government pursued an opening towards the West, and that included a very prominent pavilions uh, of Great Britain, the former colonial metropolis, and the main trade partner of Ghana and the United States. The American uh, architect Buckminster Fuller collaborated on this geodesic dome uh, of the University of Science and Technology in Kumasi. Uh, India was represented at a trade fair as a member of the Commonwealth rather than of the non-allied movement because uh, Krumak's earlier positioning as one of the leaders of the non-allied movement together with India, Indonesia, Yugoslavia, and Egypt was scaled down. Uh, it was now the collaboration among African countries that was favored, not within Krumak's vision of a pan-African union, but with a more modest aim uh, that of stimulation of uh, regional trade. So you probably now, you, I'm sure you now understand why I started to talk about uh, architecture in Ghana uh, during the period of Kwame Nkrumah with the trade fair, because the trade fair was really a note of these uh, values and often competing networks of global collaboration. And in my book, I argue that the production of, of architecture in Ghana at that period cannot be understood without accounting for these networks. Now, but how do we think about them? How do we think about this multiplicity, but also the antagonisms between these networks? And in order to do that, in order to to have a way to think about, about both antagonism and multiplicity of these networks. In my book, I introduced the concept of world making. Uh, this uh, concept was based on the writings of several authors, but today I want to introduce just one of them, the Martinican poet and philosopher Edouard Glisson. Glisson's question was this, how do we think the modern world in ways that leave behind concepts and images inherited from the colonial period. In other words, how do we think about the global multiplication of connections when the thrust of the world and its desire no longer embolden you onward in a fever of discovery? They multiply you all around. In yet other words, how do we think the world beyond colonial era expansionist concepts? And so the term global socialism, in my book's title, was shaped by these questions. By global socialism, I do not mean some kind of uniform masterminded project. Uh, rather, this term refers to various worlds that were practiced by institutions and individuals from socialist countries and their counterparts in West Africa. These worlds were assembled in various often incompatible ways. And I follow the official discourse of socialist internationalism as conveyed by these Soviet posters. Uh, this discourse was often antagonistic to other practices of world making, notably to what Anglo-American writers were describing since the 1970s as globalization. But I also describe in the book a world making from below. I am looking at actual encounters uh, and the everyday life of people thrown into an unfamiliar world to which they responded in ways that often transgressed this official discourse of socialist internationalism. And I'm illustrating this with a photograph from Kumasi which shows the, some of the Eastern European lecturers and the Ghanaian friends. So socialist world making remained between the descriptive and the normative, but it produced frameworks of interaction and exchange of very real things, among them architectural resources. And the concept of socialist world making helps me to explain the architectural production in Ghana during the 1960s. I'm interested in ways in which this architecture was produced from within competing networks of global cooperation and solidarity. In other words, I want to argue that architecture was produced not in spite of these antagonisms, but uh, because of these antagonisms. 
Now, the Ghana National Construction Corporation, the GNCC, the designer and builder of the International Trade Fair, was, in self, was itself a product of several such networks. Its predecessor was created in 1958 as a joint venture between the Ghanaian government and an Israeli construction company. In 1962, it was merged with the former Colonial Public Works Department, or PWD. And this genealogy resulted in a continuity between uh, the GNTC and the Colonial PWD, which included design procedures, building standards, and typologies, but also personal continuity. To break that personal continuity was the aim of the policy of Africanization pursued by the Ghanaian government. And that included the GNCC. During the shared British Ghanaian rule in the 1950s, and in particular after independence, high-ranking positions were increasingly assumed by Ghanaians, among them the already mentioned Victor Adegbite. Most Ghanaian architects were taking up a leadership position in the early 1960s, and they were typically educated in the UK and then in the US. Since the mid-1960s, they were joined by Ghanaians trained at the newly opened School of Architecture at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Kumasi. But also, they were increasingly joined by Ghanaians trained in the Soviet Union and other socialist countries. Yet this process of Africanization was a gradual one, and in the first decade of independence, the PWD and the GNCC heavily depended on qualified foreign workforce. Until the um, mid or early 1960s, the more prestigious buildings were designed by architects from Britain and sometimes from the Commonwealth, and then they were executed by the GNCC and the PWD. Several of these architects subscribed to the principle of the so-called tropical architecture. In the Gold Coast, then Ghana, the protagonist of tropical architecture included Jane Drew, Maxwell Fry, James Cubitt, Kenneth Scott, and Nixon and Boris. Uh, they argued the, uh, for or in favor of the adaptation of modern architecture to local climatic and technological conditions of West Africa. And uh, here you see some of the uh, more well-known buildings in Accra that subscribe to that, to that uh, way of thinking. In the course of the 1960s, the GNCC increasingly capped the design commissions, such as the trade fair, uh, for itself. However, British architects, and in particular British construction firms, uh, continued to play an important role in the trade fair, and that included, for example, the construction materials, which uh, were largely imported from Britain. For instance, that spectacular aluminum roof. In the course of the 1960s, architects from other Western European countries were arriving to Ghana, as were African Americans. Uh, among them was the um, architect Max Bond, uh, and uh, he was the designer of the Bolgatanga Library, uh, and uh, he delivered several other projects for Accra as an employee of the GNCC. And you see here the Bolgatanga Library and also uh, Bond's uh, Ghanaian driver's license. <laughs> By far the largest uh, external commission of the period, the master plan of the city of Tema, went to the Greek office of Doxiades Associates. But these links were complemented by Krumach's cooperation with socialist countries. Since the mid-1950s, the Soviets offered political, economic, and technical assistance to decolonizing countries in direct competition with the West. The Ghanaian uh, government was attracted to the socialist model of development. This model was characterized by the emphasis on state-led industrialization, collectivization of agriculture, more egalitarian welfare distribution, and mass mobilization of the society. When uh, presenting this model to Ghanaians, the Soviet referred very often to the experience of the modernization of Soviet Central Asia and uh, the Caucasus. And so on the right, 
you can see uh, images from a Soviet publication which compared neighborhoods in Tashkent, in Soviet Uzbekistan, uh, with the Soviet-designed neighborhoods in Accra. The Soviet Union granted Ghana favor credits for development projects in agriculture and industry, and uh, technical assistance was conveyed by architecture and uh, planning projects too. In 1961, nine Soviet architects and engineers arrived to Accra in order to design two housing neighborhoods. And on the right, you can see an excerpt from a Soviet newsreel uh, that shows that visit to Tema of the, of the Soviet planners and uh, uh, they, they um, visit to the mayor. And on the left, you can see the Soviet design housing neighborhood for Tema. It was to be constructed by means of a Soviet large-scale large prefabricated system uh, adapted to hot climate. And the factory for such panels, for such prefabricated concrete panels, was built in Accra, uh, and you can see it on the screen. At the same time, uh, this project conveyed a vision of a collectivized everyday life. Uh, it included social, educational, and cultural facilities, and a central canteen, which prepared food to be served in canteens in each neighborhood group. The negotiations uh, concerning the construction of this neighborhood uh, were concluded in 1966, but the project was abandoned after the coup which opened Krumah. Only a few housing blocks were constructed much later in Tema, and that's the top image. And on the bottom, you could see the elements of the Soviet prefabricated system for Ghana. Uh, neither were realized uh, other large-scale projects such as the waterfront development, the marine drive development, in Accra, designed by a Bulgarian state firm. The challenges faced by the implementation of these projects resulted largely from the fact that they were designed by state socialist design institutes based in Moscow and in Sofia and elsewhere in uh, socialist Europe. By contrast, I argue that the real impact um, on the development of Accra was made by those architects from socialist countries who were directly employed by the GNCC, who were working for many years here at the corporation. Among these architects employed by the GNCC was the Hungarian architect Charles Poloni, who designed this uh, important Flagstaff House housing project in central Accra. Later, Poloni worked for the University of Science and Technology in Kumasi. Uh, uh, the campus, as, as you would know, was developed in the 1960s uh, uh, from within a collaboration by the Ghanaian architect John Ousiado and a number of Yugoslav, uh, specifically Croatian architects, employed by the Ken USD's architect's office. And the GNCC, there were other uh, architects from Eastern Europe, including Yugoslavs and uh, Bulgarians. But the largest group of foreign architects uh, in Ghanaian planning institutions during the period came from socialist Poland. At least 31 architects. Besides Hirosh and Rymaszewski, the designers of the trade fair, this uh, group included the design architects of the State House complex in central Accra with Adegbite, again, as chief architect. Among 31 Polish architects, there were eight women. And that reflected the high status of female architects in Poland since the interwar period, but also the career opportunities open to professional women in 1960s Ghana, both expatriate women and Ghanaians. Now, the one question which I asked myself when I was working on this uh, research was this. How was this architecture perceived, experienced, and discussed by Ghanaians? In order to address this question, which is not easy to answer, um, I carried out a systematic study of Ghanaian daily newspapers between 1957 and 1966. While highly controlled and censored, 
especially during the, the end of Krumak's rule. These, new paper, these newspapers offer a glimpse into discussions about architecture by and for educating the Nayans. The architectural production of the GNCC was given a lot of attention in, uh, um, in the daily press. And this production was far from homogenous. Some of the GNCC buildings were based on colonial apologies. Yet the most discussed and the most visible among these GNCC buildings were modern. And that I mean that they referred to design principles of the modern movement uh, by uh, they they were sometimes built uh, from modern with modern materials. Uh, they were referring to modern images, and they were also called modern by some Ghanaian uh, commentators. GNCC architecture was presented in the press as a background on which bodies were both united and distinguished, from the body uh, of the leader to that of various collectives. Construction workers, school children, women, students presented proudly the buildings and on the background of these buildings, they appear as members of one specific social or professional groups distinguished by attributes such as school uniforms or nurses' aprons. Everybody appears to have their proper place in these buildings, like the school girls framed by the grid of the Abori school. Everybody is kept where they were supposed to be. For example, the people's shop in that crowd was open late at night. And as a Ghanaian journalist explained, and I quote, uh, the people's shop prevented many workers from running away from their jobs to shop during business hours. In the sense, the GNCC buildings were just redistributed the people according to the model, to the modern societal order, which they reproduced and stabilized. The commentators were also very explicit about the modernizing objective of these architectures. And for example, the girls of the Aburi school were prepared, quote, to challenge men for top jobs. Such experience of modern urban everyday was also the center of the trade fair. It included displays of commodities from all over the world, numerous restaurants and snack bars, a cinema, an exhibition gallery, and the first in Ghana drive-in banking window. The Ghanaian press occasionally mentioned the foreign architects working at the GNCC. For example, in accounts of the trade fair, the Polish design architects were photographed in friendly charts with American and British advisors. And such reports suggest that Cold War ideological divides played no role in the production of architecture in Ghana during the period of Kwame uh, Nkrumah. But was that really the case? And did the architects from socialist countries see themselves as part of the Cold War confrontation? In the last part of this talk, I will address these two questions. Now, it is clear that for Hirosh and Rimeshevsky and others at the GNCC whom I interviewed, and for them, they, were, they did not see themselves as part of the Cold War. They don't, they rather consider themselves as members of an international community of professionals who contributed to the adaptation of modern architecture in Ghana. Uh, they considered the uh, architecture in line with the principle of tropical architecture as practiced by Fly Drew, Cubitz, Kant, Nixon, Boris, and others. And when you consider the architecture of the trade fair, you, you can understand what they meant by that. Um, this is the, the architecture of, of these buildings paid particular attention to climatic conditions. And you know, this is an image I use for my students to show such a range of climatic responses by one buildings. The buildings were designed with natural ventilation. It's pronounced eaves provided shade and protection from rain. This open brickwork offered shade and ventilation. It's raised uh, roofs above the buildings and volumes raised above the ground, secure airflow. As what well, as well is the case with uh, tropical architecture, climate was abstracted into a section 
uh, and that, that was the operative model, that was the way to understand and to respond to climate. Uh, in a section isolated particular factors such as daylight, glare, rain, ventilation, and then reassemble them in one drawing. And this is most evident in Pavilion A, where the section was projected on the, on the roof. Um, in that sense, it almost become a pedagogical diagram that demonstrated the principles of rain, water disposal, ventilation of the building, control of glare and access to sunlight. The interest in climate was also supported by several Polish language publications on architecture in tropical climate. So in other words, uh, the GNCC architects thought about themselves of, as members of the same professional community as uh, British tropical architects. However, the latter did not see it that way. With the development of a state-led economy, the economic interests of British architects in Accra were undermined by the GNCC, uh, which largely uh, was staff based in Europeans. In the face of this economic competition, British architects in Accra often tried to distinguish themselves from the Eastern Europeans by means of Cold War language. In other, in other words, they presented architects from Eastern Europe as agents of socialism. That was, however, rarely uh, a view shared by Eastern European architects at the GNCC. More often than not, they perceived their employment in the GNCC as an alternative to their work back home, not as an extension. Quote, West Africa was as far to the West as we could get, told me one uh, uh, Polish architect who worked in Accra in the 1960s. The everyday life was indeed very different from the everyday life from socialist Poland. And this is quite a unique document, which is a movie shot by one of the Polish architects working at the GNCC. The first the man you, you have seen, that was Charles Poloni. And here are other Eastern European architects employed at the GNCC. And uh, here there are some shots from a Christmas party at the corporation which illustrate the, the, the everyday life of, of these professionals. The white man dancing. <laughs> yes, and there is somebody trying very hard. <laughs> Few among um, Polish and Hungarian architects working in Ghana were card-holding members of the communist parties in their respective countries. Even diplomats from Eastern Europe presented themselves as pragmatic. Stanisław Wymaszewski, again, one of the designers of the trade fair, recalled that the Polish trade councillor in Accra, quote, told us upon our arrival to Ghana that they don't need people for slogans, but people who can get things done. But if these architects did not see themselves as agents of socialism, what could they offer to Africans? This was the very question which was posed to the Hungarian architect Charles Poloni during his later work in Nigeria. After Ghana, he left for Nigeria in the 1970s. And uh, I co I'm quoting now from his memoirs. In Calabar, the authorities introduced us at a press conference. The first question put to me was the following. You are Hungarians. You never had colonies. You don't have any tropical experience. Do you consider yourselves competent to prepare a master plan for a city in West Africa? In response, Poloni pointed out at his research projects on rural settlement, which he did in Kumasi and during the previous decade. And on the left, you can see some of these uh, uh, projects from Kumasi. And on the right, you can see his earlier projects from rural Hungary. So Poloni's argument was that his previous experience and the Hungarian countryside was useful for uh, working in West Africa. Other architects uh, from socialist countries refer to their involvement into post-war modernization and reconstruction projects. For example, Grażyna Jonkaitis Luba and her husband Jerzy Luba uh, worked 
uh, here in Accra on the so-called Labad Islam clearance project in the 1960s, and you could see that project on the left. And they, again, talked about this project as benefiting from their previous experience from the reconstruction of Warsaw after World War II on the right. But Poloni also stressed a his specific historical experience that, in his view, aligned Eastern Europeans and Africans. He argued that both experienced colonization. They both experienced colonization by external empires, and he argued that this experience allowed him to uh, understand Africans. Ghanaians reporting on Eastern European countries in the 1960s drew parallels between the colonization of Ghana and the long history of foreign domination over the territories between Prussia and Austria in the West and Russia and the Ottoman Empire in the East. The most recent, and at the time best remember, installment of such parallels were, was the German Nazi colonization by genocide in Eastern Europe. In response to these experiences, Eastern European architects working in West Africa pointed at the architectural culture that since the late 19th century was invested into nation building processes. And that investment could take place many directions. It could have meant a return to indigenous architecture as an inspiration for new architectural designs. That was the path chosen by the Polish scholar Zbigniew Mochowski, who for 30 years studied indigenous architecture in Nigeria. Another strategy was the appropriation of modernism for the purposes of nation building. That was the experience of the contested territories such as Moravia or Silesia or the Balkans in the wake of World War I. Here, the radiant modernity of governmental buildings at Brno, Katowice, or Zagreb was seen as a rupture with the past associated with German or Austrian historicism. And in that sense, it was reinterpreted as supporting the new states that were emerging after World War I, such as Czechoslovakia, Poland, or the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. However, Eastern Europe's relationship to, to colonialism was much more complicated than that. Eastern Europeans participated in many ways in Western European colonial conquest and exploitation. In Poland, colonial fantasies were developed during the interwar period by the organization Maritime and Colonial League, which demanded colonies for Poland. Much more real was the program of the so-called internal colonization of the eastern territories of interwar Poland, underdeveloped and inhabited by national minorities, Belarusian, Lithuanian, Ukrainian, and Jewish. There, the typology of the Polish gentry country house was applied not only to housing, but also to railway station and post offices, schools, and military buildings. Internal colonization was sometimes accompanied by direct violence targeting architecture. And that included, notably, the planned destruction of Orthodox churches in 1938 by, in, by the Polish state. And you can see an image of that on the right. So what I want to say by all this is that the experience of Eastern Europeans was both that of the colonized and that of the colonizers. And this ambiguity was very well understood by the Ghanaian elites. Accordingly, uh, the arrival of these Eastern European architects complicated the binary between the colonized and the colonizer that was inherited from the colonial period. I am referring to them as indicators of Accra's multiple futures. That includes, for example, a small exhibition called Accra Futurism, produced by my students and students from Accra and Kumasi a few years ago. This exhibition presented competing designs for the marine drive delivered by Ghanaian and foreign architects who worked in Accra and in Krumah. And uh, we showed this exhibition in Accra and we displayed models, but also we have produced images that approximated the everyday life 
uh, that these designs afforded. The point of revisiting these uh, designs was not so much to propose them as an alternative for the current marine drive project, but rather this revisiting served as a reminder that Accra has always had more than one possible future, and that debating these futures has been a part of Ghanaian architectural culture for a long time. Thank you very much. <coughs> thank you, thank you, Dr. Stanek. He deserves another applause. Um, Dr. Stanek, this has been a very enlightening talk. Um, I've been putting some notes down myself, and I think that this uh, talk has been a revelation uh, to us. Um, it's a part of our history that, uh, to me, is a little sketchy. Um, this year, the Venice Biennale emphasized the role of the Brit that the British played in our architectural production of Accra shortly before and uh, after independence. And history has been silent on the details of how Accra progressed after it became a republic in the 60s. So we see in this presentation some personalities involved from Eastern Europe. Um, now, um, as Ghanaians, we have a balanced view of our architectural history. And uh, that the collaboration of the Eastern European architects and Ghanaian architects of the GNCC was the source of the creative, nationalistic architecture and monuments that we have today. However, as the lecture shows, uh, some of the important ones, as the trade fair, is almost all gone. And what is left is uh, left to the to their trade deteriorate in the winds of time. So, Dr. Stanek, we uh, thank you for setting the stage for us to discuss the relevance of our architectural history. Thank you. Yes. Um, at, this, uh, at this time, um, Dr. Stanek, before we go to the Q&A, uh, Dr. Stanek would like to make a presentation of his book. And so we call on the president of the GIA to uh, receive the book on behalf of the association. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, most importantly, uh, what we have seen in this lecture are pictures, maps, um, and he also mentioned publications that of Accra records that unfortunately we do not have. Uh, when you go to Tema and you are looking for Doxiadis records. Um, uh, at some years ago, there was a fire, and all those records are gone. So if you want those records, you have to go to Greece, to Doxiadis offices where these are kept. Similarly, from the lecture, you can see that uh, there are a lot of documents outside Ghana. And uh, such a lecture that we have you know, uh, and documented in this book are ways that we can connect with history and also be. My last comment is uh, that uh, I would like to think about architecture history as a book. Um, and what we are doing is uh, instead of reading the book from chapter one to say chapter 10, we are actually tearing away out the chapters and starting with chapter five as the beginning. But there is a history. If we begin to demolish the architectural heritage and uh, soon there is nothing left and we don't have the archives in these countries that we can refer, as you can see uh, online and uh, here in this hall, there are non-architects that are interested in having the history of our city documented. 
and the whole story told, not in pieces, not from um, 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 chapters that do not precede the story, but the whole story needs to be told. Thank you very much. We have the last word from Professor Wellington who will close us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deborah, for giving me the opportunity to um, make a contribution to this very interesting evening with uh, Professor Shani. Yes, um, I'm very, very grateful for uh, this scholarship. You know, the breadth, the depth of the information that brought to us this evening, and also as found in this book, is very, very useful indeed. For which I really to really express my gratitude uh, as one of the senior members of the uh, GIA. Now, by way of uh, concluding thoughts, I want to drop in this idea for you to um, view the trade fair site or trade fair development as a case for study in. What the SDGs say for cities, sustainable cities and resilient cities, whether we can learn from the story of the trade fair as it started and as it is today, whether we can have some lessons learned from that. With that, I want to say thank you very much for your excellent presentation this evening. Thank you. Do you want to say anything? Yes, so um, we've come to the, the end of this session. It's been a great uh, time. I'm uh, very happy with the audience. Uh, we have architects, engineers. Uh, we have uh, the artist community. Um, we have, for me, most importantly, uh, my friends that I made on social media and uh, we've been friends for years, uh, Reginald St. Brown, and this is the first time we are actually meeting. We are all part of, all part of our social network, and uh, we feed each other information, and he, he, he brings out pictures. So, uh, Reginald, you realize from the lecture that you are not the champion. You don't have all of the archives. And uh, together, uh, we have one vision, is to revive the history of the city so that we can tell where the future of the city. Without that, we cannot determine the, the future properly. I think the history, the architectural history, is very necessary. Thank you very much.